Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship on an absolutely gorgeous Sunday morning. Isn't it beautiful out there today? Makes you glad to be alive. I'm glad that you're all here. We welcome uh, everyone, especially those who may be here for the first time. We're glad to have you at Woodmont. And I uh, want you to know that we like to share our church with anyone who's interested. We have uh, every uh, a month or so a luncheon called Introduction to Woodmont. And next Sunday will be the next luncheon. So if anybody would like to attend that, you don't need to make any reservations. Just stay uh, after church. It helps if we know you're coming, but you don't have to. And uh, go down to the boardroom at 1215, the luncheon begins. But I would like for everyone to fill out the card that uh, you find uh, in the pew. I guess it's called a connection card. Uh, there's been some confusion about whether everyone should fill one out. We like everybody to fill one out so that we know you're here today, but also the prayer requests that are on there. If you have any address changes or email changes that you want the church office to know, make uh, mark that. This Wednesday night, we'll have a, a second session of what's called Pathways to Healing and Spiritual Formation. And it's a panel discussion about the spiritual life and it will be in the chapel beginning at 6.15 Wednesday night. My most important announcement that I have uh, to make this month is this is, as you know, a stewardship emphasis month. And we want everyone to understand that uh, the pledges we ask you to fill out, they're not legalistically binding, but they help the church plan to underwrite what we can do or not do in the next coming church year. Our church year goes from July 1 to June the 30th, and they build the budget based upon these estimates of giving that, that people turn in. Uh, we know that not everybody uh, has the same ability to uh, give or the same resources, but the goal is to hear from everybody. No matter what your, your pledge might be, uh, Clay would love to hear from everybody who attends Woodmont, who benefits from Woodmont, who loves Woodmont, uh, to let it know this is my church. And uh, so whatever you put on the card, the important thing is that we hear from everyone. So there are cards in the back of the pews before you. You got one in the mail, hopefully. Uh, if you need one, just let us know. And we hope that you will send that or turn that in by the end of this month. But let us prepare our hearts now to worship God.
Thank you, Ted. We are so grateful that you are back here with us at Woodmont to share your beautiful talents. Good morning. If you would please stand with me as we say our call to worship. That can be found this morning on page 765 of your hymnals. Oh God, you have searched me and known me. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night. Please join me in singing our hymn of praise, number 17. your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you in this time together with grateful hearts 
for a place that lets us worship, for a place that lets us sing and praise you. And we give thanks for that and so much more. Let us find you in these quiet moments and let us find peace in you while in this place. Thank you for this community of faith each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 12, verses 29 through 34. Let us hear the word of God. And do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying, for it is the nations of the world that strive after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our second scripture reading comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for ourselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. Amen. title of my sermon this morning caught your attention because it affects every one of us. All of us are rich and prosperous, especially compared to the vast majority of people in our world today. 
and the question of whether it's possible for a person to be rich and to be Christian too, in all honesty, is one that I struggled with throughout most of my life. And to show you why I struggled with it, I want to share with you some of my personal background. And in so doing, I'm sure that many of you will identify with some of the things that I share. But I grew up in a family that was not what you would call extremely rich in material things. It wasn't that we couldn't have been rich, for my dad had plenty of opportunities to do so, but it just wasn't important to him. He walked out of a law firm, a prosperous law firm in Atlanta, Georgia, left it to his partner so he could go study for the ministry. His first, or one of his second church he served was in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He went down there in 1943. He bought a couple pieces of property and he could have kept going in that land boom back then. You can imagine what that would have made him. But he gave these things up because he wanted to be a good husband and a good father to his four children. He also wanted to be a good minister and a good school teacher. He did both. We lived in a very modest house, three small bedrooms, a combination living room, dining room, a small kitchen, a small porch, and one small bathroom that all six of us shared together. You know what that probably was like. But during my uh, boyhood growing up, my family never drove new cars, but we always had decent secondhand cars. And we never had the problem of not having enough closets for all of our clothes because we just didn't have that many clothes. And I'm sure that I appreciated my two pair of shoes that I had back then, one for Sunday and one for during the week at school, I probably appreciated those two pairs of shoes more than I appreciate the dozen pairs of shoes that I have today. Because my parents were both educators and they knew the importance of a good education for their children, they wanted us to get the best. So my dad got his degrees, several degrees in teaching, and he taught at a very uh, elite college prep school in Fort Lauderdale. And one of the main reasons he taught there was so his kids could go there. Back then, we could go tuition free. And since I attended that private school, however, I grew up with the elite of all of Fort Lauderdale, very wealthy families. They had things that my family never dreamed of. They had they drove fancy cars back then, Cadillacs and Continentals were the fancy cars. They had swimming pools in their backyards. They had yachts tied up behind, beyond the swimming pools. They were country club members, and they had two or three or sometimes even more bathrooms in their house. Now, I must confess that I was often envious of what my friends had. I'm sure I must have said things to my father because I can still remember his saying to me, Roy, but we're the richest family that there is. We are far richer than all those other families you're talking about. We're rich in spiritual things. And he was right, and I learned that more and more as I grew up and matured, particularly in my Christian faith. My best friend from second grade on was one of those rich kids. He was an only child. His father was a self-made multimillionaire, orphaned at the age of six, but did really well. Uh, he, he always loved to come over to my house. I didn't understand why, because I always wanted to go to his house where the swimming pool and the boats were. But he always wanted to come to my house because there were always lots of kids around and a lot of noise and activity going on. I decided though when I was young that I would do everything in my life to see that I got to enjoy the blessings of prosperity. A nice house, nice cars, nice clothes, the wherewithal to travel and see the world. And I will always be grateful that I have been blessed in that way. But as I enjoyed my travels to different parts of the world, 
especially to a place like Mexico and Africa and Italy, the Holy Lands, and also throughout many parts of the United States, I realized how much poorer so many people were compared even to the way that my family was. They lived in shacks and slums and ghettos. They slept in alleyways with their children. They died of diseases and malnutrition, and they often went to bed hungry. And as I read my Bible more, I discovered that it had a whole lot to say about being rich and the poor. In fact, Jesus had more to say on that subject of money and materialism than any other single subject Jesus talked about in the Bible, including heaven or hell or prayer or, or anything else. He knew what money does to people. During my years in seminary and then afterwards as I began my ministry, I began to attend national and international meetings of the World Church. I began to hear more and more about the desperate plight of the poor in so many different places in the world. And then I began meeting people from Africa, Indonesia, South America, and, and even other places in our own country who lived in conditions that I couldn't even imagine. And so I began developing this uh, troubled conscience. Was it wrong for me to have so much while there are so many people who have almost nothing? Although for the most part, I have never seriously considered giving up what I enjoy, I began to wonder, was it wrong for me to be rich? Was it wrong for me to work hard and save my money so that I could provide for my family all these things that so many people never would enjoy? Am I not a Christian or am I less of a Christian because I haven't enjoyed these nice things? Nice house, nice cars, nice clothes, have belonged to country clubs, taste nice trips. I've also been overweight all my life because I've had so much nice food to overeat. And as I began my work as a minister, I became aware that there were many rich people in our society who feel that the church condemns them because of their wealth and their prosperity. Throughout history, the church has often made the wealthy feel uncomfortable as if there was no salvation possible because they were rich. But is that right? Can a person not be rich and be Christian as well? The Bible does not say that there is no salvation for the rich. Point that out very clearly. Now, Jesus may have said it's more difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom because the more you have, the more you have to distract you from God and from the kingdom. But at the same time, there are many mentioned in the gospels who were rich and who certainly entered the kingdom. Zacchaeus, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, just to name a few. The fact is that there is nothing wrong with being truly rich as long as you are truly Christian. You should not regret your wealth. You should be grateful for it. You should not feel guilty about it. You should just thank God that you have been so blessed. And you can reflect that gratitude to God by using what you have to do God's work in this world, which to a great degree means helping those who don't have what we have. So what about this question of being Christian and being wealthy? Before anybody accuses me of giving a lecture on economics rather than a sermon, let me remind you of what the Bible has to say in so many, many passages. I've already pointed out what Jesus said about wealth and materialism, the rich and the poor, that he had more to say about that than any other single subject. He said also, we are told, uh, to everyone to whom much is given, much will be expected. So Jesus told the rich young ruler that he must go and sell all that he had and give it to the poor. Now that's not a prescription for everyone, but that was for that particular young man. In the parable of the last judgment, Jesus reminds us that as you did it unto the least of these, meaning the poorest of these, 
you did it unto me. And in our scripture lesson this morning, he says, where the heart is, there will your treasure be also. No, he didn't say that. He said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And if you want to test that out, just ask big givers, investors on Wall Street, how much they think about the stock market. But uh, I guess all of the biblical teachings about wealth, uh, being rich, and about money are summed up in what we read in 1 Timothy. It says, the love of money is the root of all evil. And in our scripture lesson this morning, Jesus talks about food and clothing and shelter. And he says, why do you worry about all these things? If you'll just seek first God and God's righteousness, all these things will be taken care of. But I also know that there are some preachers, and you're especially likely to hear them on television, who will distort the teachings of Jesus into saying that if you just give your heart to the Lord, your money problems will disappear. And if you want to help them disappear more quickly, send me $100, and I guarantee you, you'll receive a check for 10 times that amount within a week. Now, it's not necessarily true that becoming a Christian will guarantee that you will be rich, because some of the finest Christians I've known have been some of the poorest people that I have known. Nor is the reverse true. If it's not true that that becoming a Christian will make you rich, then it's, it's also not automatically true that being rich will make you a Christian. Being wealthy can be more of a challenge to being a Christian, but it certainly doesn't keep you from being a Christian. Jesus may have said it's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom, but he didn't say it was impossible. What determines whether a wealthy person is a Christian or not has a lot to do with his or her attitude toward money and materialism. Do you love money and the things that money can buy or do you love God? Which one do you love more? Do you seek first money and materialism or do you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Wealth and Christianity are not mutually exclusive. In fact, all of us enjoy both. But the question is, where is your priority? Which is more important to you, God or mammon? And again, the priorities are reflected in the attitude of where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. That is true. Even though Jesus turned it around and said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Being rich doesn't automatically make a person a non-Christian any more than being rich makes somebody a lover of money. Sometimes I think that the people that love money the most and worship it and try to get it are the people that are the poorest. It's been said the only people that know the money is not the answer are the people who have had plenty of it. Still, we must not forget that Jesus said how wealth makes it harder, more of a challenge to enter the kingdom because uh, not only can it offer you more distractions from the kingdom, but it also can increase your fears, your worries, your selfishness, and your temptations. Don't forget about that rich young ruler. Let me also point out that being wealthy means more than just money itself. It also includes all the benefits that money can provide, including health care and proper medicines, the opportunity to earn an education, plenty of food and good nourishment, clothing, shelter, having a job, having the right to participate in the decision-making processes that control your life. Many people, maybe most people throughout the world, do not have those basic human rights. And there is a growing gap between the extremely rich and the extremely poor. But even though this is true, I will still strongly oppose any implication that suggests that being rich means you cannot be a Christian. I would say in return that uh, the rich Christians I have known have the resources to do more good to help others than, than poorer Christians. 
Not that the poor Christians don't do a lot of good, but the rich have more resources and, and they've been blessed and they use them as God has intended. But whether you're rich or whether you're poor, uh, whether you're rich and whether you're Christian or not, depends upon your attitude towards your wealth and toward your attitude toward other people. There are two basic attitudes we can have towards wealth. The first attitude says it's ownership. It's what I have is mine. I've worked hard. I've earned it. It belongs to me. I can do with it whatever I want to do. That attitude, however, can lead people to become very cold, callous, and selfish. One preacher even described it this way. He said, such people can eat caviar while a neighbor starves to death. They can play solitaire on Persian rugs while slum children die of malnutrition. They can pick flowers on Golgotha while the Son of God dies hanging in the rain. They are like the rich fool, the only person in the Bible Jesus called a fool who wanted to tear down his barns so he could build bigger barns to hold all his stuff. But the second attitude that you can have towards wealth, an opposite attitude, is what we call true Christian stewardship. It's the attitude that believes what you have is not your own, but it's a trust that has been loaned to you by God. And with that trust comes responsibility. You cannot do with it whatever you want, but you must do with it whatever God wants. And that includes using part of what you have to help others who are in need, sharing what you have with those who have not. The second attitude, I believe, is a crucial test of whether an individual, and I'll even say an economic system, is based on Christian principles or not. And that test is whether the individual or the economic system is concerned with only money and things, or are we concerned with enriching life for everybody, not just for a few? Uh, one of the concerns that Christians who have a world view about world economics is the question of, you know, whether you can, does your economic system reflect the values of Christ? I mean, the communist system, we know that communism does not because uh, nobody ever gains much, only a few get extremely wealthy. But the question is, to what degree is the same thing true of the system that we like and choose? the capitalistic system. From my American point of view, there's no question that this is the best economic system that there can be. But those who are concerned with the American system of capitalism do not want to do away with free enterprise and profit making, but we want to make sure that the system is engaged with the modern world and the modern world situation to see that we use what we have to help others who do not have. And uh, if America can continue to do that, we have a great future being a leading nation in the world. I'm reading a book right now. It's called America's New Map. It talks about how we're at a tipping point in terms of world globalization, economically and, and age-wise and environmentally and everything else. It says America can be the leading nation by the end of this century if we deal with all these issues in the right way. But if we don't, if we continue going down the path that some people try to lead us in, that future will not be so rosy. Some people will say that personal wealth and prosperity are private matters. But can we really say they're private matters if the ways in which we gain our wealth or the ways that we keep our wealth have enorm enormous social consequences? Nothing is a private matter if it causes public damages. So I come back to my question, can you be rich and be Christian too? It all depends upon your attitude, whether you look at your wealth as in an ownership way or in a stewardship way, whether you're willing to share what you have with those who don't have as much. It doesn't mean as in the case of the rich young ruler, you've got to sell everything you have and give the money to the poor. Jesus 
gave that prescription to him because he knew how totally attached he was to material things. He wouldn't give them up. In other places, there are other prescriptions. Zacchaeus, for example, gave back 50% of all that he had gained as a tax collector to the people that he had gained it from. But throughout the Bible, the one basic guideline is the tithe, or 10%, that we're willing to use to do God's work in this world and to share with others. I remember one time I heard a, a woman in, in the church, another church where I was, was very passionate, very upset, because she said, how can our government pay farmers not to grow crops and, and store up so much food and let it rot in warehouses while millions of people are, are starving around the world? And, and I understand where she's coming from. And, and I agree with her about the food rotting in warehouses. I do know that there are more than one reason why uh, farmers aren't, are told not to grow crops. It's so in the long run, they might be able to produce even more. But I'll be honest with you, it bothers me every week when I look at our garbage, just two of us living at home, and how much stuff we throw away. Uh, it bothers me every time I, I take it out. But in closing, let me repeat the message that I'm trying to convey. Uh, I am seeking to, to, I'm not seeking to give any false comfort or assurance to those who are rich, for it is true that being rich it makes it more challenging to be a Christian. But neither do I want anyone to think that it's impossible to be a Christian if you're rich. Maybe more difficult, but it is not impossible. And the crucial test of whether you are a Christian or not has to do with your attitude toward your wealth, how you look at it, and which is more important to you, what you have, or God and what God calls us to be and do. It's not a sin to be rich. It may be a sin to be rich and not be a Christian, but money is not the root of all evil. The Bible clearly says it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. And unless we share our blessings with others and have that spirit of generosity and sharing and caring, then I'd say we are failing the test of wealth. So Jesus said it may be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into the kingdom, but remember, he didn't say it was impossible. I'll always stand for that. And I know that Zacchaeus made it, Joseph Arimathea made it, Nicodemus made it. And so can any rich person who is truly seeking to follow Jesus. Amen. Seek first the kingdom of God, all other needs still supplied. We're going to sing this hymn we call the Hymn of Invitation. As you know, it's an open invitation to anyone who would like to be a part of the body of Christ here at Woodmont Christian Church. We welcome you. We invite you. You can come down front. Let me know that's your desire, and we will welcome you right now. Or you can go to the introduction to Woodmont Luncheon next Sunday after church and hear more about it, and you'll have an opportunity then. Or any Sunday, you can just fill out the membership card and hand it to Clay, and he will be glad to welcome you into the church. But most of us are already part of the church, so what do we do while we're singing this hymn? I suggest that you think back to whenever it was that you made a commitment to Christ and most likely got baptized into, into, Christ, into, into Christ. And uh, now ask yourself as we sing this every week, how well am I measuring up? Am I living up to what I said I wanted to be and wanted to do? And therefore we need this hymn every week to kind of be our conscience guide but before we sing it, let's affirm what it is we believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and my personal Lord and Savior. And what is the mission of Woodmont? Growing disciples of Christ, 
by seeking God, sharing love, and serving others. Let us stand as we sing. Let me just reiterate what Roy said at the beginning of the service about the prayer cards. Please remember that the staff prays for them on Wednesday, and unless you indicate they're for ministers only, the women's prayer group prays for them on Tuesdays, and we take all this seriously. Would you quiet your minds and your hearts and join me in silent meditation now? Gracious God, thank you for the wealth of blessings of health and comfort, our growing community of faith at Woodmont, our close family and friend connections, our work, the multiple opportunities we have to serve and share, and most of all, for the wealth of your inexhaustible love. Lord, you understand our pains. You tell us not to worry. Even though we know that worry does not fill our needs because you know what we need and you promise to meet our real needs, we do find that some days we just worry. Then you drive home the point that we are more valuable than the birds and the flowers that you nourish. And out of your goodness, you will meet us where we are, and we are to trust you to control every area of our life. Some of us worshiping you today, and many we know and care about, are experiencing difficult seasons in life. Lives may be in flux or at very low points for quite serious reasons. Help all of us remember you are the ultimate healer and allow your love to seep into all wounds. May all who face obstacles and ongoing challenges approach them with determination and wisdom and faith to hold on and trust you. Dear Lord, help us plant the seeds of the gospel message with those that we meet, whether it's a smile, kind words, or some bits of encouragement. Let your love touch and guide our time 
our resources and our talents to help others wisely and generously for your purposes. May our lives demonstrate that you do control what you have placed in our care. We love you, God, and we commit our lives to you as we pray that we follow the example of Jesus in whose name we join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, good morning. Let's use our imagination this morning. Imagine, at this corner of Woodmont and Hillsborough Road, there was no Woodmont Christian. It never was, and it was never meant to be. At this corner, you would have seen beautiful green hills, homes of the 30s and the 40s, gorgeous landscaped yards. And using your imagination in the early 90s, those beautiful homes would have succumbed to being raised one by one. This corner was in the eyesight of business opportunity, becoming a retail mall, maybe the Green Hills Mall, in eateries of all kinds. Hillsboro and Woodmont would be widened to six lanes. So what would be different if there was no Woodmont Christian? How diff different would it be? Well, if there was no Woodmont Christian, there would never have been 39 years of walk through Bethlehem, hosting hundreds of thousands of Christians and Christian seekers to an immersive experience of the coming of Jesus. Generations of families experiencing the miracle event. If there was no Woodmont Christian, there would be less of a place for Alcoholics Anonymous and al -Anon to meet and work together to heal their addictions and coping efforts. If there was no Woodmont, there would be less of a place for support of grieving a loss of a loved one or coping with a family divorce, learning how to bring one's life out of brokenness. If there was no Woodmont, there would be no place to explore a broken faith and return it to its vibrant self. If Woodmont had not come to be, there would be no Jan Anderson office to call to add someone to the prayer list, to schedule a wedding, or to schedule a funeral. So now let's come back to what is, okay? Look around this beautiful worship room and, and look to your left and look to your right. Family and friends and fellow worshipers, would my Christian is vibrant and was indeed meant to be. This church has prevailed for over 75 years and through near as many stewardship campaigns. This is not the first one. Every one of those campaigns supported by people like you those on your left, those on your right. Generations before us at this church envisioned what we are experiencing in this room today and in what's happening in the halls of the church. 
It took prayer and treasures for that vision to be. Let's do our part. We must sustain this glorious place for years and generations to come. So please join this year's stewardship effort generously. Thank you. Thank you, Rich, for all of those beautiful words, and I agree with all those. And as we move through this month of stewardship, there will be many people like Rich who come to each one of our services and talk about why Woodmont. And I think those are all perfect examples of why we do give to this church each and every week. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the gifts that we receive every single week that we come here to worship and to be with you. Let us be mindful and let us be thankful for all the ways in which these gifts that are given can be furthered for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live all to Jesus I surrender
One of my favorite movies of all time is the 1984 movie Places in the Heart starring Sally Fields. If you've never seen that movie, I highly recommend it. You can get it on YouTube just by typing in Places in the Heart. But it begins with a church service and the people gathered together singing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And there is a religious theme that kind of runs throughout the movie. But in spite of their religion, in spite of their going to church every Sunday and saying prayers before their meals, the lives of the people are filled with all the struggles of that time. And the movie was set during the Great Depression. And all the characters in the movie are involved in the struggles on both sides of the issues. And the issues include extreme racism, extreme poverty, no jobs to be found, bank foreclosures, alcoholism, infidelity in marriage, crime, everything else you can think of that's a part of life. And like I said, the characters are all involved on both sides of the issues. But my favorite scene in the movie, maybe my favorite scene of all times, is the last scene of the movie when the people are again back to worship, singing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, and they're taking communion. And as they're passing the communion, all of a sudden it's like the movie kind of morphs into a scene from heaven where all the people are in the church together sharing communion with each other, blacks next to whites, rich with the poor, old with the young, couples that had, you know, had trouble in their marriage were sitting together holding hands. It was a beautiful scene. And to me, this is what the Lord's Supper reminds us it's all about. Our faith is all about. The power of God's love to change us and to unite us as one big family together with each other because God is the Father of us all. Is this not what we pray for and we hope for? when we come to the Lord's table. So let us come again today that our prayers and our hopes might be fulfilled. Repeat with me the words that Jesus spoke. He broke the bread, blessed it, and he said, Together, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And with the cup, Jesus said, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for all that you have provided for our enjoyment in this life. This glorious spring morning, the people gathered here who make the Woodmont community so special and a city that provides many opportunities to see your goodness. Teach us how to look up toward you as we receive these gifts so that we may take hold of the life that really is the life only you can offer. Bless this bread as we eat it now 
and reveal to us through your Holy Spirit how to strive for your kingdom today and through this new week. Heavenly Father, we are privileged again to gather at this table and take this cup, symbolic of the blood of Christ. We commit ourselves with all our needs and anxieties to your faithful keeping. All that we have comes from you, and all that we do comes from the strength you provide. Help us love you with all our hearts and serve you with all our strength. We ask these things through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Wouldn't it be interesting if this week everybody turned in their pledge card, the whole church turned in their pledge cards, and then we'd have to see what Clay would preach about the rest of the month? <laughs> That'd be interesting. Well, let's try it and see. <laughs> Anyhow, have a wonderful week. And uh, this morning at the 930 service, you know, the sun hadn't really come out, but when we opened the door of service, I mean, people were just walking into the light. And I thought, what a metaphor, what a symbol of what it's all about. May you enjoy that life this week. Let's prepare for our sending forth. Go forth now and live, leaving your worries, your troubles, your fears, your sorrows behind, because you've taken in their place faith and hope and love, for these are the gifts of Christ to you. Amen.